World War III, is that about to begin? We will talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about the Trump trial. We're going to honor the fallen. We have so much to get to tonight on I'm Right. All right, before we get into FISA stuff, the government, all the, all the other things, World War III, Iran, Israel, all kinds of things going on tonight, we wanted to start out in honor of the fallen, as we try to do as often as possible on this show. And sadly, it's often, isn't it? If you watch this show regularly, you know this is something that we do often when military people die in training, in combat, when... Police officers, sheriffs, firefighters give their lives, whether in the line of duty, training, whatever we try to as often as possible, honor them. And it was a, uh, it was a busy weekend. On Friday, Memphis police officer Joseph McKinney gave his life. He was killed while investigating a suspicious vehicle. Of course, he's killed by a guy who'd been arrested a million times. He had a wife. She will never get to hug her husband again. And... Just remember that these guys are out there, right? There, there are lots of very good guys risking their lives and sadly, too many losing their lives. We lost a couple of police officers in upstate New York as well. Uh, they have not released their names yet, so we're not gonna release their names yet. Uh, the suspect is dead. Ross Bartlett, in a different incident, Ross Bartlett, officer had served for 30 years, 30 years in uniform, was struck by another car in a traffic stop. This is something that happens too. Talk to police officers, especially highway patrolmen, state troopers out there. They understand you pull that car over, it's not just the guy that may pull his gun on you inside, it's the person driving up the highway at 80, text messaging, drunk, whatever, veers off and splat, you're gone. And it's, uh, look, keep the families in your prayers, all right? Well, well, you and I woke up on a Monday. Maybe you were complaining about going to work. Maybe you weren't. Maybe you took the kids to school, breakfast, had a good day. These families are obviously going through hell right now. So please keep, keep them in your prayers. All right, let's move on and let's discuss. Well, the human element. Let's discuss the human element. FISA. Okay, so what's going on right now in Congress with FISA? Here's what you need to know. Here's the 30,000-foot view of what you need to know. What they're debating right now is, does the government need a warrant to accidentally get your data? And th this, is, this is what I mean. Well, technically, the government needs a warrant to spy on you, to look at your text messages, your emails. If you're at, let's say, the FBI, you can't just say, wow, Susie looks pretty suspicious. Hey, let's read her text messages. You're not allowed to do that, technically. FISA has been a way they've been doing that for a long time, and here's how it works. This gives them the authority to spy on foreign nationals, foreign terrorists, or potential terrorists. You see, you don't need a warrant if you're in the FBI to read some dude's emails from Iran. So what happens if you swap an email with this guy, a text message with this guy. Remember, it doesn't have to be someone you know is a terrorist. You could be dealing with uh, buying some special wallpaper from Paris or who knows. And the FBI happens to be monitoring this guy, reading his text messages, and they get yours. Well, hey, look at this. Look what Susie said. Hey, we better open up a file on Susie. Backdoor spying on Americans. It is a violation of your civil rights. You, and I know this country has no concept of this anymore. I very much saw that during COVID, that the American people don't understand this. But you understand, I, I know this sounds basic, so just stay with me. You understand that you're supposed to be free, right? Free. You were blessed by God to be born in America, the land of the free the land where there are strict limits on what the government, including law enforcement, can and cannot do to you. You are a free citizen. You do not live in a dictatorship. They should never be able to look at your stuff without permission, ever. And so let's talk about the GOP. Because listen, <laughs> 
I'm trying not to be a cynic. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but let me just give it to you. I know we've had some successes with the FISA stuff over the past few days, just before the weekend. They got installed. All this is great news. Now there's another vote. This, all this stuff's going to go through again. I'll give you the good news first. The good news is it was more difficult for them to pass this this time than it ever has been in the past. Once it's all once it's all done and passed, I mean, it'll be have been more difficult this time than it ever was in the past. That's a good thing. That means we're moving in the right direction and we're dragging these useless losers in the GOP in the right direction. Now, why do we fail? Well, there's something we forget. On top of regular GOP weakness and whatnot, we do forget about something I call a lot the human element. You see, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, has infamously been against this kind of warrantless spying on Americans for really all of his career. Well, now he's Speaker of the House, and he's out there whipping up votes to pass the thing. And here was Mike Johnson when he's asked, hey, why the change of heart? When I was a member of the judiciary, I saw all the abuses of the FBI, the terrible abuses over and over and over, the hundreds of thousands of abuses. And then when I became speaker, I went to the SCAF and got the confidential briefing from sort of the other perspective on that to understand the necessity of Section 702 of FISA and how important it is for national security. And it gave me a different perspective. So I encourage all the members to go to the classified briefing and hear all that and see it so they can evaluate the situation for themselves. And I, and I think some opinions have changed both ways, but that's part of the process. You've got to be fully informed. Have you been in the Excuse me. My entire career, I was against this whole FISA thing. Man, that's dangerous, illegal, spying. But now that I became speaker, I went to a classified briefing. Whew. If you knew the things I know, you'd want that FISA to go through. That's what he said. Okay, so what are we dealing with here? Well, I don't know for sure, and you don't know for sure, but I do know a couple things. One, let's just get the obvious maybe out of the way first. Maybe... Mike Johnson is compromised in some way. We don't know. This happens very regularly to politicians in America, around the world, and all throughout history, so don't act like this is some crazy conspiracy theory. Intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies, especially ones like ours that hoover up a lot of our data, a lot of our information, they end up finding out that everyone is a criminal or has things that they're not proud of in their background, and that is how they have infamously throughout history controlled many, many, many politicians. Is that what happened here? No, I don't have any idea about that. I have no inside knowledge. I don't know. Could have. Could have. Did Mike Johnson walk in there and some FBI guys say, hey, Mike, <clears throat> you know how you were against FISA? Hey, we need you to vote yes on this. Otherwise, Mike, I mean, we've got, we've got these pictures here. Remember that time you were out of town? We got these pictures... I'd hate for these pictures to get to the L.A. Times. So, Mike, vote our way. Did that happen? I have no idea. I have no idea. But it happens. It definitely does. Could have happened here. I don't know. I don't know. But the more likely thing that happened is the human element portion of this. This is, in case you're wondering why these GOP types end up selling us out to the deep state over and over and over again. Why does this happen so consistently? Well, here's how they get you. Remember, Mike Johnson, GOP leadership, all of them, as much as we despise them and get frustrated with them, they are flesh and blood, human beings, just like you, just like me. They are. And to, to us, they can turn into TV characters, right? It's just someone you see on your TV, but they're flesh and blood people. Mike Johnson's a dude. How do these deep state types get their stuff through? Well, they ham up these meetings and these briefings. They know exactly what they're doing. They have all these... All these binders there. Wow, FBI. They'll bring it. I guarantee you. I, 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 I would bet my mortgage on this that they brought in a specialist who deals with terrorism, counterterrorism, something, something cool like that. Some title. Hey, Mike Johnson, this is me, Officer Jerkwater, counterterrorism division. Let me tell you about ISIS and what they're potentially doing in your town next week. And they get you in this classified briefing and you feel super important and the walls are soundproof and there's armed guards at the door and they tell you... There's a terrorist attack coming. Look, everybody isn't privy to this. Only you are. But I want you to open up your 
super secret binder turned to page 12, paragraph E. This was presented by Super Ninja Delta Force Special Agent Mike Counterterrorism Johnson. And then he says, whoa, man, I had no idea. Well, we're going to be attacked next week? Jeez, you guys need FISA. This is how they get our guys many, 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 many times. Sometimes they are compromised. Sometimes they are. Sometimes it's just a matter of these police agencies and intelligence agencies, FBI, CIA types, they understand how to make themselves look critically, critically important. After all, these agencies, their entire livelihood depends on members of Congress stroking them huge taxpayer-funded checks so they can do what they do. What they want from you is a check with no accountability. That's what they want from you. How do they get the check? And how do they get the lack of accountability? You go sit Mike Johnson down in a secret classified briefing and tell him how important he is and how dire the situation is. And look, let's be honest, terrorism is real. There's no question about that. And the threat of domestic terror, it is going through the roof. There's no question about that. It's just that the FBI can't do anything about it because they're now just a Democrat agency aimed at Republicans. They don't even really care to do anything about it. They weren't having meetings to discuss which ISIS member to put on the terrorism watch list. They were having meetings to discuss which school board mom to put on the terrorist watch list. And now we have this deal with Iran. What's happening there? What's going to happen there? Well, we got a situation, a bad one. Iran decided to do an official attack. And the reason I call it official is, look, everyone knows Hezbollah, when they shoot rockets, those are Iranian rockets. When Hamas does something stupid, it's funded by Iran. Everyone gets that. Everyone knows. But that's different than the state itself launching a state-on-state -state attack, which is what Iran did over the weekend. Launched a bunch of drones, launched a bunch of missiles. Now, where does that leave us? Well, officially... On paper, we have to get involved in any fight our allies get involved in. Remember, whatever your foreign policy may be, that's how it works. When you are an ally, when you have an ally, you fight for them, and they fight for you. Where's this going to go? Well, I don't know. I don't have any idea. But neither does the president. It, it, Joe Biden was on the beach when Iran launched its missiles. Remember. Joe Biden knew this was coming. We had reports about this before Joe Biden went to the beach and still he threw on some sunscreen, maybe a cooler full of Zimas, and went to the beach. And not only that, we now have report, reports courtesy of the Jerusalem Post, courtesy of Reuters. So I don't know. I mean, we're, we're venturing into the it's been confirmed realm. Let's just say it's been reported by multiple publications that the Biden administration not only knew about this attack ahead of time, that they greenlit the attack, essentially telling Iran, okay, I mean, yeah, you can do something, but just make sure you have some limits on it. So we greenlit our enemy to attack our ally? I, look, when I say I don't know where this is going, let me be clear about this. I'm not so sure Israel is going to stay allies with us. Maybe you're thrilled about that. Maybe you don't like our foreign policy when it comes to Israel. Maybe you're dreading that. It really doesn't matter whether you, what you like or don't like. But if I wake up today and I'm Israel and I find out that the United States of America knew about an attack on me, green lit the attack on me, and now reportedly we have told Israel not to respond. So you just told my enemy to attack me and you've told me I'm not allowed to respond and you're my ally and you're his enemy? I don't know where we go from here. I don't know whether we're going to wake up tomorrow morning and all will be normal in the world. I don't know whether we're going to wake up tomorrow morning and the oil fields of Iran will be on fire and we are at war. I don't, I don't know. But I do know we have a bunch of demented, deranged communists running the country. Joe Biden is the commander in chief and dang, that should make you uncomfortable. In fact, all that should have made you uncomfortable. But I am right. We have a huge night for you. We're going to talk a little bit about Iran. What are they? What did they do? What do we think they wanted to do there? They didn't actually really kill anybody by, by what we can tell. It didn't really hurt. And if it was, it was like a, a random guy here. They want, what are they doing? Let's talk about that with Dave before we talk about that.
Now would be a real good time to take some financial steps to make sure that you're safe if things get a little frosty out there. And they might get a little frosty out there. Do I need to remind everybody Russia does military drills with Iran, who does military drills with China, Venezuela's involved, they've been moving into Mexico. I don't know where all this is going. But I know that some of your money had better be in precious metals physical gold or silver coins, whatever. I don't care. Oxford will mail that to you, anonymous and insured. They'll get it in your IRA, in your 401k. This is how you protect yourself from whatever calamity may be coming, because who knows what's going to happen there. How much money do you think they'll print if we get into war? Call them. These are my friends. They will take care of you. 833-995-GOLD. All right? 833-995-GOLD. We'll be back. And I wonder, Mr. President, what you would say to him if he is considering using chemical or tactical nuclear weapons. Don't. 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 And I wonder what is your message to Hezbollah and its backer, Iran? Don't. Don't, don't, don't. Well, that didn't work out. Joining me now, my buddy Dave Raboy. He, of course, does late Republic nonsense on Substack, which I enjoy all the time. Okay, Dave, uh, first of all, let's deal with Iran. It's very common in this country to think of Iran like some backwater dump with a bunch of mud huts and whatnot. And while I'm not the biggest Iran fan in the world, that's not necessarily the case. They sure did have a lot of missiles and drones, Dave. Well, they did. Um, uh, Iran is, uh, is not a third world country. It's a second world country. Uh, no thanks to the mullahs. And um, Biden really, I mean, when he said no, don't, um, I think that I mean that there was obviously BS because we've got reports that uh, that the Iranians cleared their their actions, their acts of war against uh, against Israel with Biden. He gave them the thumbs up. He said, you know, act, uh, you know, with within a, a particular constraint. Um, so Biden and the administration greenlit essentially three hundred. Um, uh, you know, launches of, uh, of ballistic missiles, of cruise missiles, of drones um, at the Israeli population centers. And, um, you know, I mean, t t talk about uh, an irresponsible, um, uh, talk about an irresponsible thing to do, a r ridiculous, unprecedented thing to do. Just, you know, hey, just, uh, just, just do it sort of within these limits. We'll shoot down most of them if we can't get them all you know we can't get them all some israelis will die but you know but uh you know go ahead iran do your thing i mean it's it's ridiculous and it's just another example of how this administration has been um uh the, really the, the 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 successor to the obama administration when it comes to um uh prioritizing iran and when it comes to uh to ditching our allies in favor of iran Dave, can you help me understand something, at least as, as you understand it, between Obama and Biden? And this is just the way I saw it, and maybe I was wrong. I saw Obama, especially given his background, the Frank Marshall Davises of the world and whatnot, as just really just being someone who just hates Jews. That's how I took it. He's from that community, that black liberation theology community. He just doesn't like Jews. And then I saw that would probably be the ax to grind he had with Israel. Joe Biden... He just seems more than anything else like he wants everything to shut up and go away because it's causing him problems domestically. He doesn't come off to me as some guy who hates Jews like Obama did. He comes off to me as a guy who doesn't like his poll numbers in Michigan. Well, I mean, I think I think that's true to a great extent. Um, with uh, with Obama, it was definitely uh, it was definitely some personal animus. But I think I think that analysis isn't entirely right because sure, there's some personal animus when it comes uh, uh, to to Barack Obama, the man. Um, but he had an administration that was all pulling in the same direction, and they didn't necessarily share that type of animus. What they did have was an ideological animus against Israel. And they view Israel as white. They view Israel's enemies as brown. 
or not white at the very least. And uh, that's the the far left frame through which they view uh, international affairs uh, the same way that they view domestic affairs through that prism. Um, so it's it's not surprising. In the Obama administration, I mean, as, as we both know, uh, Obama, um, uh, Joe Biden is is uh, you know is is basically out of it um, when it comes to the the day to day and and you know frankly even the hour to hour and minute to minute knowing where he is uh, at times. So this administration is jam packed with um, with folks who love Iran uh, who hate Israel, and uh, that's just what we're seeing. I mean, um, we have. We have all kinds of reports of, uh, look, their point man for Iran, the Biden administration point man for Iran, Robert Malley, uh, mysteriously left because there was some kind of a, uh, um, there was some kind of a, uh, uh, a, you know, that when they, they did a background check and they didn't like what they found, but they didn't want to announce it and tell everyone that, uh, that this guy, uh, Robert Malley, who's got long-standing relationships with the Iranians, long-standing relationships with Hamas and Hezbollah, etc. You know, he, he just kind of disappeared, um, even though his people are still in, uh, in the administration. So, and we know, we know several folks who work in either in the White House or in the State Department or, or you know, in other capacities for Biden that are, you know, kind of hardcore pro-Iran, hardcore anti-Israel. So this is what we're seeing. And, and yes, it, it does have to do with uh, with winning in Michigan on one hand, but on the other hand, this is what these guys actually believe. Dave, let's talk about Iran for a moment. Now, that was a whole lot of rockets and drones and missiles and other things which you just laid out for virtually no loss of life. And I'm, I know we're still sorting through the rubble as it is, an injury here, maybe a death there, but very small amount. And I can't help but wonder... Did Iran actually want to hurt Israel at all? I mean, talk about a weak attempt at something. Is this, this just them trying to save face in front of somebody? Well, I think I think there was uh, there was a there was a definitely a face saving aspect uh, to this. Um, on on one hand, on the other hand, is look, I mean, it could have been a disaster. It, these missiles could have. Uh, could have gotten through. I mean, even if 10% of the missiles could have gotten through, that's a lot of loss of life. And and you have to remember, you have to put these missiles into the same context as the Palestinian missiles and the uh, the uh, Hezbollah missiles that uh, that rain down on Israel all the time. I mean, just because the death toll isn't huge, it doesn't make these less of a war crime because these are, by definition, uh, targeting uh c- civilians i mean there's no there's no military use for this uh, at all um a lot of apologists for the iranian regime like to say oh you know israel um you know israel bombed a um a site in damascus next to the consulate which they lie and they say that it was an embassy it wasn't an embassy but it was a uh, it was a, an annex to the consulate where irgc terrorists military commanders um, that are legitimate military targets uh, were meeting in order to uh, to plan attacks, more attacks on Israel through uh, Iran's terror proxies. And Israel whacked them. Um, and then to respond, you know, quote unquote, respond to to this uh, to this action by blanketing an entire country and putting the you know seven million people in Israel um, under. Uh, you know, under f- fear for their lives, that they're that they're you know coming with three hundred drones and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, etc. I mean, it's no small thing, and it's definitionally a war crime. Uh, the the purposeful Dave, targeting of uh, of civilians. Dave, I understand the uh, the how nice it would be if you're a nation like Israel and have somebody park a carrier group right off your shore to protect you, but if you're Israel. And you have to now go through this every time there's a Democrat elected. I mean, we got Joe Biden out there today reportedly telling them not to respond. If you're Israel, why bother continue this ally thing? I, and look, I, 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 why bother with it? Who does it help? We're, we're holding them back, holding them back in significant ways. I understand we also help in significant ways. Not to be a hothead, but why bother continuing this? Why not just call America and say, hey, we're, we're done with this. We're divorced. 
Um, look, I mean, I, I think that's, I think you make a, a, a great point. Um, the, the U.S.-Israel relationship is complicated for, for a number of reasons. Um, but I have long been an oppo- uh, a, a proponent of, you know, of, of uh, allowing Israel to make its own weapons, which is something that in, inside the Beltway and in the Pentagon is a big no-no. And, you know, everybody, everybody seems to think that, uh, that, you know, we're just handing Israel, uh, you know, bucket loads of money. But that money comes with significant strings attached. And that, that, those strings are, you need to buy these weapons that you're buying uh, from American manufacturers, which, of course, makes Lockheed and, and, uh, and the military industrial complex in this country very, very happy. Um, on the other hand, too, policymakers in Congress and in the executive branch look around and they say, well, we would rather have, the Israelis are buying a lot of gear. So if they're buying a lot of gear, they may as well buy from the United States because if they're buying from China, then, um, you know, then, then that's not good for us uh, strategically. So that's the situation that they're in. I've long advocated for them to be able to manufacture these weapons uh, in Israel. But before we get to that, we're going to have to have this fight in, um, in, in the executive branch um, in, in, in the United States. Um, hopefully we're going to win an election. Hopefully, you know, Donald Trump is, uh, is, is elected in November and then we can start the mechanics of, of, of changing this. But, um, I mean, look, don't you think that the Israelis would love to be able to make their own iron dome missiles and to not have to come back every once in a while to the United States and say, Hey, we need, we need more stuff because we're in it. We, live in a dangerous neighborhood and we're in an active war zone fighting against Iran's other, you know, uh, several proxies from the Houthis to, um, you know, to Shia militias in, uh, in, in Syria and, uh, and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and, of course, uh, Hamas in Gaza, not to mention what's going on, uh, you know, the, uh, the disaster that's going on in, in the West Bank with, uh, with the Palestinian Authority. So they have a need for a tremendous amount of ammunition or else they're going to, you know, or else they're going to die. And it's in their best interest and frankly, our best interest for them to be, um, be building this stuff and building their weapons uh, base, manufa- weapons manufacturing base uh, in Israel, which is something that they would love to do. Uh, we just have yeah. to allow them to do it. Yeah. Dave, my brother, thank you as always. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like it. All right. Let's talk about lawfare. What happened in New York today with all this Trump stuff? Before we get to that, let's talk about something wonderful. How I start my day. No, there's nothing in here right now. Why? Because it was blackout coffee in here, and I already drank it all like I always do. I, I talk all the time about putting my money where my morals are. And I struggle with this. I know you struggle with this. Where do you spend or don't spend your money? And look, there are a lot of different places we have to go. With coffee, we can actually go to a company that shares our values, though. That's what Blackout Coffee is. They're not ashamed of you. They love you, the country, your values. And they have 20% off your first order. I personally, I get the whole bean because I like to grind it at the house, but that's just me. Go blackoutcoffee.com slash jesse go get you some coffee we'll be back this is an assault on america nothing like this has ever happened before this is an assault on our country and it's a country that's failing it's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case this is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. Joining me now, host of America on Trial, my friend Josh Hammer, to break down a few things for us. But beginning right there, Josh, what happened in New York today? There are so many trials. It's civil, it's federal, it's state, it's city. I, I can't keep track of everything. What is this one today? Jesse, today we crossed the Rubicon. I mean, that's basically what happened today. I mean, when Alvin Bragg first announced his criminal indictment of Donald Trump, the column that I wrote immediately after that was titled The Point of No Return. 
And I opened that column by talking about when Caesar physically crossed the Rubicon. That is what we have now done. This is the first formal day of the first criminal trial of a former president, let alone also a current major presidential candidate of the United States. And from here, Jesse, who knows? I mean, we are in deeply uncharted waters. It is Pandora's box all over again and kind of zooming out from a 35,000 foot altitude level. I think that asking questions right now about how America is qualitatively different from, you know, South African tin pot dictatorships or South American di dictatorships, sub-Saharan Africa, all these questions are totally fair game. Is America really going to go down the rabbit hole of actually prosecuting its political opponents? And we, we can go in the weeds here. This case with Alvin Bragg is utterly ludicrous, it is farcical on its face. Alvin Bragg's theory of the case is absurd. The federal prosecutors there in the SDNY looked into it. Alvin Bragg's own predecessor in the Manhattan DA's office, Cy Vance Jr., they both looked into it. They both concluded that this was bunk, that they were not going to press charges. Alvin Bragg is a Soros-funded far-left hack who literally campaigned for his job on a Get Trump platform, so he has no such compunctions. But before we get in the weeds, Jesse, I just want to make this basic point, which is this really is a point of no return for these United States. And as someone like myself, who's a lawyer by background, I clerked on a federal court of appeals. I revere the U.S. Constitution. I love this country deeply. It, it really, above all, has me both angry, as you can hear my voice, but above all, just really, frankly, sad. No, it is sad, Josh. And, and the wildest thing is for normal people to watch this absurd thing play out, it doesn't look like this thing's going to end in any way that is good either because these people can just do whatever they want. We know what the jury pool is going to be in Manhattan. We know we know how's this end, how this ends. What's the timeline look until Donald Trump is obviously convicted? Yeah, it's a total circus. I mean, th this whole prosecution in New York City is is a total and complete circus. The judge here, Juan Marchand, based on my surveying the, of the evidence, definitely should have recused himself. So Jesse, to make sure that we're all caught the speed here, it, it's this judge here, his name is Justice Juan Mershon of the New York Supreme Court. It's kind of confusing in New York State, the Supreme Court's actually the trial court. So his daughter, Lauren Mershon, is, she works for a democratic political consulting and fundraising firm called Authentic Campaigns. Her company has been fundraising upwards of 90 plus million dollars for clients based on the fact that the employee's father is presiding over this judge. He has placed a sprawling and likely unconstitutional gag order on Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not currently allowed to criticize anyone other than the judge and the prosecutor himself. He can't criticize witnesses, jurors. It's likely unconstitutional in violation of his First Amendment rights here. They are estimating a six to eight week trial. I think it's probably going to go on a little bit further than that. They're trying to right now whittle it down from a potential juror pool of 500 to 1,000 jurors. So, so they haven't even come close to actually finalizing the actual the actual jury pool yet. By the way, even, even the juror questions here on the actual question sheet that the judge Juan Marchand signed off on, the questions are absurd. They're asking questions like, are you a QAnon supporter? Are you a Proud Boy supporter? I mean, talking about giving away the game here. But this is all happening in Manhattan, in New York County, New York. Manhattan went 87 percent for Joe Biden in 2020. I mean, Donald Trump tried to get this case removed from Manhattan to Staten Island. It was one of various motions that the judge here, Mershon, denied. So this thing's getting started. And I do fear, Jesse, that we are more likely than not to get some sort of guilty verdict. OK, is Donald Trump going to prison? And if so, when? I do not think so, no. Uh, the, the actual underlying crimes here, so uh, again, the theory of the case is fairly elaborate. So this goes back to the pre-2016 election hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's former fixer, who has subsequently been a convicted felon himself, and he's been disbarred as an attorney. Michael Cohen made these payments to Stormy Daniels, and he was reimbursed by the Trump Organization. And the alleged crime is that the Trump Organization improperly recorded its payments to Michael Cohen as, quote unquote, legal services, rather than marking it down as a campaign finance election contribution, meaning that they argue that this was done in furtherance of Donald Trump's 2016 political campaign. Here's the problem, the Jesse. The, 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 there are a lot of problems here. First of all, there's a two year statute of limitations on the actual fraudulent bookkeeping charge. 
Bragg purports to get around that by saying that it's in furtherance of this campaign finance violation. I'm not so sure about that taking at first blush. But the more important point I want to make here is in order to argue that this is done for campaign finance vi violation, I mean, in order to make the campaign finance argument, you basically have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt, that's the criminal threshold, that all of this was done in sole and exclusive purpose of aiding Donald Trump's campaign. In other words, the fact that maybe he just wanted to like shield this from his children or do something else, you have to show that none of that had anything to do with it. But this, Jesse, this is Donald Trump. I mean, this isn't like Mike Huckabee or Rick Santorum, like a very public facing Christian trying to kind of make a, a small foible or mistake go away. Donald Trump's the guy who has the Playboy magazine covers at Trump Tower and the penthouse. Why would he try to hide this? It's basically part of his personality. So the prosecution has a ridiculously uphill battle to climb here on the actual legal merits. Again, the jury pool might just be so far left enough that it truly just simply does not matter. But ultimately, I don't think jail time's in the cards here. It'll likely be some sort of probation fine. I, I do not predict that jail time's going to come here, but it is possible. All right, quickly, the Supreme Court, January 6th, political prisoners. Obviously, these people are ones I've been talking about for a long time. Is SCOTUS going to help them out? Tough to say. It, it, it's a very in-the-weeds debate over the interpretation of two words in, in a subsection of what's known as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. This is a statute that was actually passed after the Enron accounting fiasco about 20, 25 years ago or so. So prosecutors have tried to invoke a, a very specific subsection of this statute to basically argue that the J6 prisoners were obstructing proceedings, that they were obstructing Congress. And it's going to come down to the very specific interpretation of two words in the statute, the word contextually and the word obstruction. It's going to be a close call here. It's not a particular, it has political ramifications, obviously, because it's January 6th, but the actual legal case itself is not inherently political. It's a somewhat in the weeds, arcane statutory interpretation dispute. So it's it's very hard to make a prediction there one way or the other. But I, I based on my superficial reading of, of the briefs so far, it seems like it's going to be a close case, I think. Okay, well, that sucks. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it, buddy. Uh, dang it. Because people cannot catch a daggone break. All right. We're going to talk about anti-humans real briefly. Next, before we get to that, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the timeshare that you want out of. You're stuck in a timeshare. Sucks, doesn't it? They keep charging you the annual fees, and that sucks too, doesn't it? I, I know. And it all sucks. But what if you could be free? What if you could get out? You know that you can, right? You know that Lone Star Transfer will legally and permanently get you out of your timeshare. All you have to do is make a phone call, but not to the timeshare company. This is a family company, a family business. A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They're wonderful to deal with. They're successful 99% of the time. They've helped over 20,000 timeshare owners legally and permanently get out. So get out, all right? Call them, 844-310-2646. We'll be back. You know what Solzhenitsyn called communists? Solzhenitsyn, you of course know who Solzhenitsyn was. He was the citizen of the Soviet Union, spent some time in the gulags, wrote, of course, the books Gulag Archipelago. He was well acquainted with communists. But you know what he called them? I always thought this was so fascinating when I would read his stuff when I was younger. He called them the enemies of humanity. The enemies of humanity. It's quite a thing to put out there, right? But the more and more you read about these people, the more you find out about them, the more you find out they really are anti-humans. They're anti-humanity. Have you ever noticed that to the communists, every problem is a problem you can silence or kill your way out of? It doesn't matter what it is. Modern American communists are the exact same way. Have, have, you ever, have you ever spent any time with one of these climate change types or seen enough video on these climate change types? They normally don't lead with this, but in the end, they'll just flat out tell you, well, I mean, we, <clears throat> a couple billion people kind of need to die. Just tell you that. Well, th there's a problem. It wouldn't be a problem if, what's that woman's name, Jane Goodall? She said, 
Well, about 90% of the people on earth need to go away. 90% gone. Is it, see, this, there's a problem. It wouldn't be a problem if a bunch of people would just die. Now, why are they this way? Well, here's really the fundamental difference between you and your liberal Aunt Peggy, between you and a communist. The difference is you are pro-humanity, pro-human being. Whatever your value system is, whatever your belief system is, you understand every single person, every single person is a unique person with a unique purpose and a, they're a person who should be free and should live and should thrive and succeed and fail and do all the things we human beings do. But to the communist, the communist doesn't share your value system, so the communist doesn't feel that. They really are anti-humans. Did you hear Bill Maher? I, look, I should credit him for his honesty. Did you hear Bill Maher and his thoughts on abortion? None of you believe it's murder. You know, that's why I don't understand the 15-week thing. Or the Trump's plan is, let's leave it to the states. You mean, so killing babies is okay in some states? Like, I can respect the, the absolutist position. I really can. I, I, I scold the left on when they say, oh, you know what? They just hate women, people who aren't pro-life, they, uh, pro-choice. They just, they don't hate women. They just made that up. They think it's murder. And... It kind of is. I'm just okay with that. I am. I, I mean, there's 8 billion people in the world. I'm sorry, we won't miss you. That's my position on that. What? That's quite harsh, Bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not is sure that you're really not your position if you're pro-choice? Isn't that mainly because you don't like children? I mean... Yeah, no, exactly. no. I mean, but if you are, you're, you said you're pro-choice. Hmm. That's your position, too. Hmm. I credit his honesty. And look, that's how your liberal Aunt Peggy feels too. I know it's murder. I mean, you know they're all lying about that, right? But when they use pro-choice or reproductive rights or whatever words they use to lie about it, there's a reason they're lying about it because they understand it's murder too. Everyone knows it's murder. Everyone knows that's a baby, a poor, defenseless, unborn baby. Everyone knows it's alive. Everyone knows you go in and snip its head off and piecemeal its body out of there and throw it in the trash can that it's murder. The truth is, half of our society, at least, is okay with it. I actually am not even angry with Bill Maher. I want to give him credit for finally being honest. Your liberal Aunt Peggy will never be that honest. These communists, as their demonic ways of thinking get more and more mainstream, are getting more and more saying these kinds of things publicly. You see this, you see this woman on TikTok? I like to think of my uterus as the deep end of a pool at a water park. No children allowed. But if they end up there, they die. I'm not even angry. It's sad. And it is sad that we share not just a country, a planet with this many people who hate humanity itself. You know, I'll say this to wrap it up because I want to get to lighten the mood and some other things, but as big of a jerk as I am, and I know that I am, I, I understand that, I don't pretend to be a nice human being, I am, at my core, pro-humanity. When I scream about uh, COVID lockdowns, I was screaming on your behalf, you. I wanted you to be able to go to work and go to school and live your life and prosper. When I scream about securing the border, it's not because I want to be mean to a bunch of illegals coming up here through Mexico, it's because I care about you and your way of life, in your country. I'm genuinely pro-humanity. And that is the reason why I despise communists so much. Because they hate humans. They are, at their core, anti-humans. They are. All right, let's do some light in the mood. Next. All right. It is time to lighten the mood. And the Masters golf tournament, a big one, I, I, I shouldn't have to explain that, but I realize some people may not know what it is. There's a huge major golf tournament every year called the Masters. It was over the weekend. It's a really, really big deal to win it. This guy named Scotty Scheffler won it. And it is so wonderful to hear professional athletes talk like this after a win. 
sitting around with my buddies this morning. I was I was a bit overwhelmed because I told them I was like, I wish that I didn't want to win as badly as I did, or as badly as I do. I think it would make the mornings easier. But I I love winning. I hate losing. I really do. And when you're here in the biggest moments, when I'm sitting there with the lead on Sunday, I really really want to win badly. Um, and my buddies told me this morning, you know, my victory was secure on the cross, and that's um, that's a pretty special feeling. Um, to know that I'm secure for forever and it doesn't matter, you know, whether or not I win this tournament or if I lose this tournament, um, you know, my identity is secure for forever. James. That's as good as it gets. I'll see you tomorrow.